Several organizations currently led or formerly led by President Trump are under federal or state investigation. The Trump White House and the Trump campaign are perhaps the best known to the public, but Michael Flynn's guilty plea came from questions about his actions during the Trump transition. Meanwhile, the Trump organization is under scrutiny for allegedly benefiting from the Trump presidency. And some new reporting from our next guest found that the Trump inauguration may have improperly benefited Trump properties. This comes as the Trump Foundation, which is under investigation in New York, agreed to shut down. Joining me now is Ilya Meritz. He is the co-host of WNYC's Trumping podcast, which won a DuPont Award for news podcasts last week. And back with us are Keir Dougal and Rebecca Royfe. Both Keir and Rebecca are former prosecutors. All right, there will be a quiz at the end of this, Ilya. <laughs> um, but let me start with you. Before we get to your reporting on the Trump Inauguration Committee, let's talk about the Trump Foundation, because that's the news of the day. Why is the Trump Foundation shutting down and what's going to happen to all of its money? Well, the Trump Foundation has wanted to shut down, in fact, for some time and asked to shut down. The reason that it still exists at all is that there is an active lawsuit in the state of New York by the attorney general. And her name is Barbara Underwood. And she is looking into violations of possible violations of state and uh, IRS laws, basically governing how nonprofits are supposed to do their conduct their business. They're supposed to not engage in self-dealing. They're not supposed to benefit their own directors. Uh, they're supposed to stay away from political activity. The 40-odd page um, civil suit outlines a million different ways that the foundation allegedly violated those rules. And so that's why the foundation still exists to this day. What happened today is the judge said, OK, we've learned enough. The suit will continue to proceed. You can now dissolve the foundation and the attorney general barbara underwood has said she will give that money it's about 1.7 million dollars as i understand it to reputable charities so the question now uh, rebecca and Kier, is this the end of the investigation into the trump foundation or is there more to come rebecca I think this is just the beginning. I mean, I don't. I was a prosecutor in New York, and I grew up here back when um, Trump was really just a real estate mogul. And uh, we used to say the real estate business in New York was deep in fraud, and that I mean, you know, nobody knows. But I think that it's not just his foundation. I think this is his business. This is how he ran business. This is how real estate is done in New York and was done in New York. So I'd be surprised. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. What do you think, here? Yeah, I agree. And the and the un uh, sort of the unfinished business of this lawsuit is the people that ran the foundation. And so while the money now will be dispersed, hopefully under judicial supervision for appropriate charitable purposes, you've still got the people who are running it who um, uh, allegedly broke all these rules and there needs to be an accounting there. All right, uh, let's turn to uh, Ilya's reporting here. Uh, there's a chart, Ilya, that I want to show you and our viewers uh, of the amounts raised by the last four presidents for their first inaugurations. And there we see um, the outlier in that group. These numbers are adjusted for inflation, first of all. We want to make that clear. But you see the outlier there would be President Trump's inauguration um, raised more than $40 million than his counterparts. So, Ilya, where did all the money go? It's pretty stunning, and this has sort of become a parlor game for some journalists and citizen journalists who are just really interested to find out. I've been looking at it all year. Uh, what I can tell you after months of reporting, making phone calls, looking at documents, studying the information, is some of the money went to the Trump International Hotel in Washington, D.C. That's located at 1100 Pennsylvania Avenue, just a short distance from the White House. And it's interesting. This was sort of hiding in plain sight. It was known that there were a couple inaugural events at the hotel. What was not known and had not been admitted by the nonprofit committee that was putting on these inaugural parties was that they were directing some of that money to a Trump organization property, the Trump International Hotel. They could have stayed away for appearances sake. Uh, that's not what happened. And I have seen emails and we published emails that show that they were warned, in fact, that when this came to light, that there could be an accusation that they were overcharging. Now, we don't know the final amount that was paid, but the amount that was quoted, according to one of the planners, was way high by at least 50 percent.
And how was Ivanka Trump involved? According to the research, you mentioned the emails that you uncovered. This was very surprising to me because it hadn't been reported anywhere that she was involved in the inauguration and, and nobody had told me that she was involved. But when I was shown these emails, what I saw was that uh, Rick Gates, uh, who's been convicted on unrelated charges, is now a felon, he was a key planner person in the inauguration. And he got in charge with Ivanka to try to get a rate on the Trump Hotel. So she connected him with one of the managers at the hotel. And it was that manager who quoted this price. At this point, it's a group email with six or seven names on it. But we see that one of those names is Ivanka Trump. And Ivanka is among the people who is being warned directly. Keep in mind, this is being done for the benefit of the president-elect. This is going to be audited. When it comes to light, people are going to know that some locations were gifted i.e. by implication, this location was not gifted. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, they may have charged a high rate. In addition to that, a lot of the inaugural planner people, I I've been told 15 to 20, were staying at the Trump Hotel for a period of about a month prior to the inauguration. So again, the hotel was going to be busy during the inauguration sure. no matter what. They were going to make money no matter what. They, the, the inaugural committee could then have chosen to stay away for appearances sake. They didn't do that. Um, and so to be clear, you also though talked to a lawyer for Ivanka Trump. What did the lawyer say? Yes. Yeah, so well, we spoke to Ivanka's ethics advisors spokesman, which okay. is itself an interesting title. That is an interesting title. OK. And what he told us was very interesting. He didn't deny that this has happened. He said that Ivanka asked for a fair market price. Those were his words. I didn't see the term fair market price in the emails that I saw, but I only saw a couple emails. I don't know what else is out there. We asked for more evidence that, that she sought a fair market price, and I haven't seen any so far. Um, the inaugural committee says it complied with all the relevant laws, and it's not aware of any kind of investigation of it right now. Okay, nevertheless, um, we should mention, like, the Wall Street Journal has reported that there is now a look uh, by some federal investigators into where, in fact, some of that money from the president's inauguration committee actually went. Is, it's, that's what we know so far. It's fascinating, yeah. So, Rebecca, take a step back with us here. What can we sort of glean based on the reporting, based on these various investigations, about the way in which the president, his associates, those close to him, his family members, operate. Is there some kind of preliminary conclusion that we can come to at this point? Well, I think earlier on in your show, you had Sarah uh, Sanders suggesting that the president had nothing to do with Flynn. And I think that seems to be a line that he's trying to take. It's becoming increasingly hard because there's one common denominator to all of these investigations, and that's Donald Trump. And in fact, it's not just not only is he a common denominator, he actually runs all of these organizations that are being investigated. So for him to try to distance himself from this becomes increasingly hard, in, in, impossible. And also, when we talk about criminal charges, if there are any coming down the pike, um, the question of intent is going to be very hard for him to suggest that he didn't intend to do something when there are so many different aspects of his work that are being investigated. Uh, Kira, I imagine some people watching will say, well, so what? He was trying to make some money. Um, can you kind of put into context for us, why is it that these investigations into financial dealings, a business business dealings are just as significant, some might argue more significant in some ways, than the Mueller probe itself. Right. The, the overarching big question that all of this conduct and all of this alleged wrongdoing and all of this raises is um, who, who is the administration working on behalf of? Is it on behalf of us, which is what most of us expect? Or is it is it being driven by personal interest, the self-dealing uh, uh, that that appears to be in the foundation, for example? So we talk about the rule of law. We talk about nobody is above the law, though for most of us, because we we all sort of adhere to that. If you don't do those things, you're it's, you, we don't want people to break the law because it. For us, it's you're sort of like cheating, mm -hmm. um, people getting an advantage by breaking the law. But for high government officials, these rules have another purpose, which is to help us understand in whose interest um, you're behaving. That's why we have the disclosure laws about foreign uh, foreign um, advisors and what tripped up Flynn. It's uh, it's at the core of a lot of these questions. Um, so that's that's my big takeaway: is like why. Uh, did these people do it? And are they working on our behalf? That's the, the core question that I have. Um, so I want to ask a sort of big picture question. We only have about a couple minutes left, I'm told. But let me start with you, Ilya. How much 
difficulty does it now look like the president is is facing from a legal perspective when you look at the financial um, investigations into the Trump uh, inauguration committee into the uh, Trump organization itself um, as you look ahead for what the president and his team of lawyers are going to be facing what does that look like now that legal landscape well, if, you, if you remember back a few months one of his lawyers said that the Trump organization, the Trump business, was a no-go zone for Robert Mueller. That's clearly not the case. And I think the Trump Foundation suit being back in the news today reminds us that not every investigation is terribly complicated. In fact, the Trump Foundation suit shows in a pretty simple way, and the Trump people have pushed back on this, but it seems to show in a pretty simple way a lot of violations of the rules of how you're supposed to conduct business. In fact, several of the examples that are provided in that suit, the Trump Organization has already um, reimbursed money that it may have spent improperly. That's part of their argument to say there's nothing really to this suit. We've already fixed, you know, what were clerical or paperwork errors. But that's a foundation that hadn't met in like almost 20 years at the time that the suit was filed. So what I see is a continuing pileup. Yeah, what do you think here? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Another thing that we'll all be looking for now is this emoluments lawsuit, which is along the same vein as this Trump Foundation lawsuit. We also, of course, we don't know what Robert Mueller knows, but um, I think the president is in a great deal of legal distress at this point. Rebecca? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the, um, y you know, the million dollar question is collusion, and that has been the question for so long. So I think we all have our eyes on that, and that remains, I suppose, the most serious question. And I think there's a lot more evidence, circumstantial, but evidence that leads me to guess that there was, in fact, some level of collusion. But even if not, uh, these all these lawsuits so, show such depth of um, corruption and a disregard for all of these laws that, as Keir said, are fundamental to the integrity of the democratic system and to the marketplace that, um, it, you know, those in of themselves are, you know, will pose legal danger to Trump for years years, even past the presidency. All right. We'll all be watching closely. Rebecca Royfe, Keir Dougal, and Ilya Meritz, thanks to all of you for helping to break down all of these developments. A lot to keep track of. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.